Um, good afternoon. Um, we are going to talk about driving pressures. And this whole story started some years ago in the chaotic city of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo, depending on how you consider, has 25 million of people. And there is flooding every year. And when we have flooding, uh, we have this kind of environment where people has to walk. There is some remains of rats. And then there is this leptospira. And this enters the skin in abrasions of the skin. And then typically when you have a patient with a fatal form of leptospira, this is what happened. You have a bleeding circuit. The nurses get crazy because the ventilator malfunction and it's a terrifying environment for the caregivers. And uh, during this environment, I did my residency. And then uh, what we had to stop the bleeding was the ventilators. And they were very old fashioned at that time with lots of buttons. And then you're in the middle of the night and then you have to handle this. And in this hospital in Brazil, uh, it's a public hospital where we were centralizing the, uh, uh, the care of patients with leptospirosis. We had to face this situation. And then along the night and with many of my colleagues, we realized that pushing the buttons of the ventilator in certain ways, we could stop the bleeding. And then later on, we developed this concept for patients with ARDS, assuming that the bleeding was just an exacerbation of ARDS. It was a kind of vasculitis making the situation a little bit worse, but the basic physiology would be the same. And then we showed for the first time that protective ventilation could decrease mortality by half. And then when we finished the study, we applied a kind of bundle. Uh, it was not exactly uh, a surgical procedure that we could establish exactly what we did. It was a whole strategy that worked. And then later on, it was a small study. We did a multivariate analysis to understand which was the factor most, more important for survival. And then we came to the conclusion that it was driving pressures, which I'm going to describe to you. If you have a ventilator curve like this, and then you have the waveforms for pressures that you are applying the airways, driving pressure is the oscillation of alveolar pressures, is what your lung is sensing, the variation in pressures inside the lung. And then uh, it's just because of technical problems that we don't show this number on the screen, but we can easily calculate. The problem is that ventilators much more easily, they show you the tidal volume. And there is an obsession about tidal volume. And uh, in fact, some years ago, when they started to show that uh, the ventilator could kill patients, and in, in fact, it was increasing mortality by 200%. There was a kind of uh, uh, obsession about volumes, and then we created this term volutrauma. And even the old physiologists, they were obsessed about this volutrauma, and then if you pay attention to the basic message of this paper, it's not about volume. The Didier Dreyfus was talking about transpulmonary driving pressure. So it's the gradient of pressures, the gradient of pressures oscillating inside the lung across the respiratory system that is causing the injury. Why this is very important? I'm going to show you some example. This is not just a conceptual thing, it's a practical thing. So we are going to do a mental experiment. Mental experiment is something that the physicists, they do a lot. In geometry, also, you do it. You reduce the complexity of a problem using two dimensions. You get the basic equations, and then you apply to a three-dimensional, four-dimensional space. 
In physics, there is this famous example of Albert Einstein. He was trying to understand which is the relationship between the speed of light and gravity. And then he did something very simple. Let's reduce the complexity of the problem. Let's imagine a ray of light entering a hole in the elevator. And let's try to imagine if this ray of light is going to bend if the elevator is accelerating. So if you're lifting, we are giving a push to the elevator, what is going to happen with the ray of light? And then he did the equations in two dimensions, and he compared the equations to the same elevator, stopped in a static position, but with a gravity field pulling the elevator to the center of Earth. And then he came to the conclusions, wow, the equations are exactly the same. So keeping the proportions, because we are talking about something much more simpler. We have two patients with the same chest wall, but completely different lungs. One patient has, on the left, has a compliance of 50, because he has an almost healthy lung. And on the right, you have just one lobe working. Okay, you apply the same tidal volume, something that we can easily measure at the bedside. You just do these basic equations of the respiratory system. I'm not going to describe this. But you can easily calculate that the transpulmonary pressure, the gradient of pressures across the alveolar walls, the tension in the alveolar walls, is going to be nine times higher in the patient in the right. So the same tidal volume caused completely different consequences. So tidal volume cannot be important. You have somehow to scale your tidal volume to the lung size. When you're calculating lung size, one of the best ways you have to do at the bedside is to measure compliance. Compliance is a kind of, you are measuring a kind of a, elasticity of the lung, how elastic is the lung, how easy he accommodates tidal volume. By formula, compliance is a certain tidal volume divided by the gradient of pressures that you created, you cancel. This is driving pressure. So driving pressure is exactly tidal volume divided by the size of the lung. So I'm applying the same tidal volume to two different patients, completely different consequences, and the driving pressure is much larger in the, right, in, the, in the patient in the right. So whenever transpulmonary pressures increase, the driving pressure increases. And this is always true. And let me show you a very simple example. This is a patient in our lung unit. So Technically, all the physicians there are experts. And then we had this patient with a slight lung fibrosis, and then he was submitted to open lung biopsy. And then he had to do one lung ventilation, so selective intubation, and ventilating only one lung during anesthesia, and then he received a thoracoscopy on the other side. The thoracoscopy was on the right side. As you can see, after anesthesia, the patient developed ground glass opacities in the left lung. What is this? Ventilator-induced lung injury. Just two hours of anesthesia exacerbated the pulmonary fibrosis, and this patient developed a full-blown form of pulmonary fibrosis and died in the ICU 10 days later. So, the anesthesiologist was trying to use a protective ventilation. So what is the concept of protective ventilation? Use 6 mLs per kilogram of tidal volume. And he did it, applying zero of PEEP because this patient had lung fibrosis. What he didn't realize is that the driving pressure was 29. It's the difference between plateau pressure and PEEP. 29 is twice the number that we consider safe nowadays. So along the years, we collected data from many different randomized trials on mechanical ventilation. 
all of these trials were trying to, let's say, to corrupt, to, to, to check if the first publication that we did many years before talking about leptospirosis would apply for patients with ARDS. And uh, we could collect the data of all these trials due to a very important collaboration between the physicians. And in total, we have 3,500 patients. It, it was a very long work, more than 12 years getting this data. And then if you look at here, I'm representing the end expiratory pressures in black, so the baseline pressure that you keep on the ventilator, and the inspiratory pressures, the upper bar in gray. So this is the representation of driving pressure. So if I take 600 patients in each of these columns and I increase driving pressures, what is going to happen with mortality? Something that was kind of intuitive. Mortality is increasing according to increasing pressures in the ventilator. But something that this analysis made possible is that we could also resample the same population of patients in a different way. And now we have patients with the same severity of disease, increasing levels of baseline pressure, what we call PEEP, and now the same inspiratory absolute pressures. This is very interesting because this is reproducing some old physiological studies, and then what we observe, a decrease in mortality. This was very reassuring because this was telling us that what we observe in animals also applies to patients. But the most intriguing resampling was this, because now we are increasing at the same time the PEEP levels and also the inspiratory and the inspiratory pressures something that some people consider very dangerous. But look at this, the driving pressure is exactly the same. What is going to happen? Neutral. This was very interesting because no one could believe that a patient with 33 of inspiratory plateau pressures, a limit that everyone tries to avoid, has the same prognosis as patient with 20. So the first observation, the conclusion of these analysis is that you should not look at absolute pressures in the ventilator, but just the swings in pressure. And this is the final graph in this publication that we show that each centimeter of water, if you increase the swings in pressure in the ventilator, you increase by 4% mortality. These, uh, this paper was, this publication and this research was changing a dogma because everyone believes in the protective role of a small tidal volume. If you look at the physiology and some animal studies, there is no doubt that the force in which you deform the lung is much more important than the size of the deformation. So the cells, they sense force, not volume, because there is lots of unfolding inside the lung. So to show this uh, to a very skeptical revision of this paper that took more than two years, we again resample our population, taking patients in five subgroups, same level of inspiratory pressure, decreasing levels of driving pressure, and then obviously mortality was decreasing. But now we did the same thing for tidal volume. Same inspiratory pressures, decreasing levels of tidal volume from 12 to 5. What do you predict? Neutral. So the size of the tidal volume does not matter. What matters is the pressure that it is generating. And the same happened for barotrauma. When we take clinical barotrauma, patients that needed a chest tube to avoid the pneumothorax, to remove the pneumothorax, each increment in driving pressure was increasing this risk by three or four times, but tidal volume was not. 
If tidal volume increases and you're not increasing the swings in pressure, there is no problem. A very skeptical comment after this uh, publication was the following. So driving pressure is measuring by formula, by mathematical formulation, driving pressure is tidal volume divided by compliance, which is the elasticity of the lung. So why driving pressure is just not a marker of the severity of disease? So to prove that it was just something that we inflict to patients, we had to do a mediation analysis. Just as at intuition, we decompose in a mediation analysis the driving pressure that the ventilator is generating into two components. A component that is caused by the disease of the patient and a component that the physician is imposing to the patient. And then we should prove that both are significant and related to the bad prognosis of the patient. And this is what we did. But then to do it in a in, in a publication in a good journal, and then we tried to publish this retrospective analysis in the New England Journal, we had to do this mediation analysis. And then let me just give you a brief introduction of what is this. It's going to take just one minute. So our minds are imprinted by the causality thoughts. We have a cause that precedes the effect, and then if the cause is withheld, we don't have the effect. This is what we call the counterfactual. Just as an example, let's suppose that Michael Fox had a lung transplantation four years ago. He is alive, but what if he had not received the lung? We can take a time machine, we get the help of Professor Emmett, we go four years before, we remove the transplantation, we remove the cause, and Michael Fox disappears. This is imprinted in our brains. No fire, no burn. No sharp knife, no cut. So the counterfactual outcome is different from the real outcome. The problem is that in real life, there is only one outcome per individual. We don't have the counterfactual. So it's not observable. So what we do nowadays is that we use an, a kind of uh, instrumental analysis. We do randomized trials. And then we have a population that is very similar to another, which we call controls. And then we can assume that I have the fact and the counterfact simultaneously. Some patients receive treatment, some patients do not receive treatment, and I consider that they are the same patient. In mediation analysis, we do something very similar. We have the cause, the mediator, and the effect. The mediator is in, in the middle of the chain of causality. So if we increase PEEP, we recruit alveoli, we must have improved oxygenation. Which is going to be the counterfact in this case to remove the lung transplantation? We have to block the mediator. And then we have to check if there is no change in the mediator, there must be no difference in outcomes. The only possibility is that you have a direct effect, but preferentially not, because I would like to show that there is complete mediation. I mean, the only way to achieve the outcome is through a change in the mediator. So, for instance, if I have a protective ventilation, I randomize the patients, I apply the package, I, I, I suppose, I made the hypothesis that this is caused by a change in driving pressure, and then I have an improved survival. How to block the mediator? In regression language, to when we do an adjustment for a model, a model of survival, it's uh, equivalent to observe. For instance, I would like to check if antibiotics work for older people, but they die more. So how do I do? I adjust for age, and then I can assume that in this population, after adjustment, 
is like observing patients of the same age all over across the population. So in mediation analysis, you can do the same thing. When you adjust the model, you, it's like observing the population with the same level of mediator. So if I included mediation, the mediator inside the multivariate model, I can check if it's still there is an effect, direct effect of randomization. If it's not, I have a complete mediation, and then this parameter is essential for the outcome for the patients. And this is exactly what we did. I have randomizations. I have lots of trials showing that protective ventilation is important. Very significant effect. I had the mediation mediator, which was the driving pressure. And then I checked that it was decreased in most patients that survived. Now I include this variable in the multivariate model. And then I observe what, what, what would happen. So there is no more effect of randomization. So this proves that the only way the patient can survive is through a decrease in driving pressure. I did later on the same thing for tidal volume, and tidal volume was not mediating survival, and then there was a direct effect of randomization in survival. So tidal volume does not work as a mediator, but this is what we do at the bedside. We, jo we just pay attention to tidal volume. And a target tidal volume is just good on average in patients, but this is certainly a one-size-does-not-fit-all approach. We should be looking at driving pressure, which is tidal volume divided by lung size. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Tim, do we have maybe a question? We, we have a, uh, a plethora of questions, most of which are highly technical and um, I think best directed to you uh, via the Twitter sphere. But some general questions. Um, one sort of mode that's come out to summarize would be, uh, is there any more role for um, essentially VC modes of ventilation? Um, there is, but... Uh in fact, the monitor should not display to us the tidal volume. It should display the driving pressure. I think the mode per se is not important at all, but the, uh, the, let's say the consequence in terms of driving pressure is what is causing the bad or the good outcome of the patient. Okay. And I guess the other question was about prospective studies. Um, where are we at there? Um, some, uh, I think, at least uh, two studies are starting to, to uh, now, one in Canada, the other one is in Brazil, and trying to test prospectively this hypothesis. And then in the intervention arm, we are going to target a certain driving pressure instead of tidal volume. And then in the control arm, you, we are going to target the traditional 6 mLs per kilogram. Let's see the final results. Excellent. Thanks very much.